The cat was sitting next to me, but he's decided he doesn't want to join me. Anyway, I've tried to go a bit further. I don't know how many knot on me tie is doing. Look, I'm wearing actual smart bottoms today. I'm not going anywhere. I don't know. I feel like maybe I might go into town after this just so I can walk around for a bit and be seen in all of my besuited beauty. Anyway... Hello people of YouTube, Dane here, and today it's time for my March wrap-up. And March has been crazy, because basically I had a week off just on holiday, where two of the days I read three books in one day, two days in a row. And so, yeah, I have 28 books. This is this is the pile. Um, I don't know how... Very carefully, maybe... Ah, it's gone. So, let's just get into it, because there are 28 books to go into, and I don't want to keep you guys too long. A lot of these have also got reviews, so I will link below in the description where that is appropriate. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I will tell you what I can. So, the first book I started with was City of Glass by Cassandra Clare. And this actually took me the best part of the first week of March, so it wasn't a particularly strong start to the reading month. And uh, this is a buddy read with Kit Kats Can Read, Damien Tariquez, Lisa West Coast Reads, and Sophisticated Books. And I actually quite enjoyed this one. I gave this one a 4 out of 5. I think it's probably one of the stronger ones in the original trilogy. There was stuff in this that actually surprised me, which is about time because... <laughs> I guess because I watched the show on Netflix. Oh, me, me tires sideways. Because I watched the show on Netflix, I spent a lot of time, you know, I spent a lot of time in the first two books being like, I knew that was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. And there were a few bits that genuinely took me by surprise in this. So for that alone, you know, it was, it was all right. And I am actually genuinely looking forward to the next one we're going to read in April, which is The Clockwork Princess. The first clockwork one. We've got the first clockwork one coming up. Then I read Trespass by Mikey Campling. And this is for Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. Sorry. Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. And I didn't enjoy this one too much. It, it cover, on the cover it says it's a tale of supernatural suspense. But it is actually more of just sort of YA fantasy I would say. A review for this and for City of Glass are in the description below. And... I mean, it just wasn't what I was expecting. And after reading City of Glass, in between that and this, I also tried to read a Holly Black book and DNF that. So maybe it was just the wrong time for me to pick it up. But I, I just didn't enjoy it very much. I had a few issues with sort of various plot points as well, which I wasn't too sold on. And I don't think I'll be reading the rest of the Darkling Stone series. But, you know, that's just me. Oh, I gave that book a three out of five, I think. That's what I'm giving it now, anyway. Uh, then we have Stephen Jaboski, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And I don't think I need to say too much about this. Most people have heard of it. It's also been turned into a successful movie, although the book was better. And basically, it's an epistolary novel written by a kid called Charlie. And it just sort of charts his coming of age, really. He sort of falls in love, gets introduced to LSD, for example. His sister has an abortion. So it's quite a dark book, actually. I think it's kind of considered to be a YA book but really I enjoyed it as an adult to be honest I read the entire thing on the way back from Latvia and I gave it a 5 out of 5 definitely recommend it then I read 30 questions people don't ask the selected poems of Inga Gale transla translated by Yeva Lasinska this is published by Pleiades Press I actually went to the launch night of this in Riga in Latvia during my trip there for Latvian Literature Week and it's a signed copy which is very nice and I also got to see the poet, you know, do readings from it in both Latvian and English. What is cool, actually, is it's presented with both Latvian and English as well. So one side is the Latvian and one side is the English. It's not really going into focus there, but... I don't know, what I found interesting is a lot of it's kind of longer form than British poetry, I guess. But I liked a lot of the imagery and I also liked the fact that because I'd spent some time in Riga, I recognised some of the different things she was talking about. And I believe I gave this a 4 out of 5. If you're into poetry, check that one out. Speaking of poetry, I then moved on to A War All The Time, poems 1981 by, to 1984 by Charles Bukowski. This is some of Bukowski's later poetry, so I think he was sort of in his 60s when he wrote this. And this is just a, another one of the beautiful Echo Press collections. These things are like, they're just stunning. They're really, really beautiful. And I read, I read most of this in one go as well. There was a poem there I just spotted about Ginsburg. 
I'm trying to find a really short one that I can read to you to give you a feel for it. Because it's hard to review entire poetry books. Especially when, like, I've read about 30 Bukowski poetry books. So after a while, you know, they all start to start to blend together a bit. Come on, give me a short one. Alright, I'm just going to quickly read this one called Truce. I need to walk down a sidewalk somewhere on a shady afternoon, find a table outside a cafe, sit down, order a drink, and I want to sit there with that drink, and I want to fly to land on that table. Then in the background I want to hear somebody laugh. Then I want to see a woman walk by in a green dress. I want to see a dog walk by, a fat dog with short brown hair and with grinning eyes. I want to die sitting there. I want to die upright, my eyes still open. I want an airplane to fly overhead. I want a woman to walk by in a blue dress. Then I want that same fat dog with short brown hair and grinning eyes to come walking by again. That will be enough after all the other, after everything else. And yeah, I really enjoyed it. I gave it a four out of five. War all, all the Time by Charles Bukowski. Then we have some more poetry. I was in a bit of a poetry hype, I think, especially after seeing some of the Latvian poets. And this is Hotel Life by Katie Lewington. This is also actually a little signed copy that she sent to me for review purposes. I've read some of Lewington's stuff before. This is published by uh, CWP Collective Press, based in Buffalo, New York, which is interesting because Katie's British as well. And it's um, it's like a chapbook. It's kind of handmade. I think I think it might even be hand numbered. And um, for, for people who like that kind of stuff, and people are into zines and that kind of stuff, I would heartily recommend this. And just anyone who likes modern poetry in general, general, because it's because uh, it's called Hotel Life. It's basically travel poetry. So, and I gave that one a four out of five as well. Then we have some more poetry. So this is Charles Bukowski, The Rooming House Madrigals, early selected poems, 1946 to 1966. And to be honest, at this point, I'm so close to finishing reading Bukowski's entire bibliography that I'm just going out of my way to try and read them all now. These were his early poems. They weren't quite as good as his latest stuff. I think he would yet to find his style. It feels quite derivative of other poets at uh, a lot of different points in this, which is kind of funny because Bukowski himself hated people who did that and was always raging about it in his own poetry. But still, it is worth reading if you are a Bukowski fan. If you're not a Bukowski fan, it's probably not the best place to start. I still gave it a 3.5 out of 5, though. Here is Sad-Eyed Mules of Men. Daily the sledgehammers and the sad-eyed mules of men, and there was Christ hung like dried bacon, and now the con men raking it in. The young girls, the mansions, the trips to Paris, and look, even the great artists and great writers raking it in. But where do we go while the great writers are saving their own souls? Where do we go? To hell, of course, juggling their collected works under our collective arms. After that, I picked up The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, and I buddy read this with Sophisticated Books. And this, this is possibly, it's my current favourite for my book of the year so far. That's how good it was. It's also Unseated 1984 by George Orwell as my favourite dystopian novel. And I love George Orwell and have read all of his books. So this is my first Margaret Atwood book. Just totally blew me away really. And um... Yeah, now I want to read some more of her work, basically. I read this in, like, two days. I know everyone, you know, it's really bleak and stuff like that, but I happen to really like and really enjoy bleak books. So I've actually seen people kind of use the bleakness of this book as, like, a reason to score points against it. And I'm like, but that's its genius, the fact that it's so bleak. But I really like bleak endings like that. I think it's really well done. Of Mice and Men, the, the ending of, of Mice and Men, I said in my review of that, it was perfect. So, despite the fact that this was super bleak, I thought it was fantastic. I did think the kind of, uh, there was, at the ending, after the end, there was a, just like a transcription of a lecture held, uh, kind of after the events of the novel. And I think that actually took away from it for me. It basically ruined the original ambiguous ending and set up a slightly weaker, still ambiguous ending. And I, I don't know, I just don't think it needed it. But still, five out of five, heartily recommend. Then we have David Shilter and Sunita Muznis, Baltic Comics Magazine number 27. I basically picked this up because it was pretty cheap and it has the most kawaii little cover ever. It's not actually just Baltic uh, authors and illustrators though. There are people from all over the world. There are some Spaniards, some Americans I believe. And there's a huge range of different styles in it. The actual writing itself isn't necessarily fantastic. But it is, it's basically like a little zine. And if you like little zines... Definitely get yourself any issue you can, you can find of the Baltic comics, and um, I mean you're kind of you're supporting 
so supporting kind of indie writers and illustrators and stuff as well. So I, th I think why not? So yeah. And this I believe I gave a 3.5 out of 5 to. By the way, just thinking about it, The Handmaid's Tale probably does have a review up for it now as well. So that'll be in the description. There was also a review for this and this is Latvia 100 Snapshot Stories and this is by the Latvian Institute. So I did point out in my review of this that this is not for sale, you can't actually buy this. What you can do is you can download this for free as a digital copy so I will put a link in the description box for that. And this is basically, it's all about telling you about the different things of the makeup sort of Latvian culture. It's really well you know, laid out, well written actually as well, like it's very engaging the way that it's written. And it's actually a fantastic way to get to know some more about the Latvian culture and you know there's the Freedom Monument for example, what's this on the left, I couldn't see that, the War of Independence, uh, basketball, so Kristaps Porzingis, you might have heard of him, he plays for the New York Knicks, here is, uh, I, I actually saw this building, it's stunning in, in up there in person. So yeah, I think I gave this one a 4 out of 5. It uh, doubles up as a nice little non-fiction book. And I can imagine this being picked up by Lonely Planet or somebody else and actually being released properly. And I hope it does get picked up. Okay, so next up we have Deborah Orma, The Emergency Poet, an anti-stress poetry anthology. And basically, this kind of subdivides stressful moments in our lives into different, uh, what would you call them, like sections, I guess. So we've got tonics to lift the spirits, hope, Courage and inspiration, uh, talking to grief, be alive every minute of your life, getting older, etc, etc. And it's just a poetry collection of all kinds of poetry, both kind of contemporary and classical poetry, dealing with all these different subjects. And uh, I heartily recommend this actually. She's also done another one called The Everyday Poet, that's it. She's got another one out called The Everyday Poet. And I was sent a copy of that one and really enjoyed it. So I saw this one going cheap and bought it from the works here in the UK for like three pound. And it's just beautiful, really. Definitely recommend it if you're into poetry. And uh, yeah, I gave this a four out of five. This is the day that I read three books in one day now, or at least one of the days I read three books in one day. So the first book I read was How to Train Your Dragons, How to Break a Dragon's Heart by Cressida Cowell. This is book eight. I read book one previously and I saw this in a charity shop for 49 pence, which is less than a dollar. So I just thought I'd pick it up. I actually really enjoyed it. It turns out you don't need to read these in order. I probably am gonna try and pick up the rest of these books now, especially because, you know, it took me an hour maybe or something like that to read it. and. Uh, it's, it's just fun, you know, even as an adult it's a lot of fun and I gave it a 4 out of 5 and I definitely want to read more of the books. I've also been watching the, well I have watched the seats, the TV series of it on Netflix but it turns out the book and the TV series are quite different. Okay then we have Ricky Gervais presents the world of Carl Pilkington and I'm just saying this is written by Carl Pilkington. It's actually basically transcripts from the Ricky Gervais show, except then there are a few extra bits like some little cartoons and stuff that Carl drew and, you know, his various thoughts on life. So here is here is thoughts on religion, for example. And basically, you either know who Carl Pilkington is or you don't really, but he's just a really dopey so-and-so. What's weird is that even though I've heard the radio show, so I've heard all of the jokes and stuff in this, it was still genuinely making me laugh out loud. And again, this is part of the day that I read three books in, so I powered right through it. I think I gave it a four out of five. It just made me smile. Then I've got Simon's Cat in his very own book by Simon Tofield. So if you've seen Simon's Cat on YouTube, you'll kind of know what I'm getting at with this. This is basically the book of that YouTube channel. And the only problem I have... Oh, it smells weird as well. The only problem I have is that because it's just like these still illustrations, there's no dialogue or anything like that. Like half the time it's actually quite difficult to understand really what's going on. So it was okay, but I only gave it a 3.5 out of 5. And then my girlfriend saw another one of the books in the series and I didn't really want to read it, but she got it for me so I had to. Okay, then we have End of Watch by Stephen King and this is the last book in the Bill Hodges trilogy. And basically this kind of rounds things off with Brady Hertzfeld and uh, Bill Hodges who is the cop who's trying to investigate him. Basically Hertzfeld committed some terrorist attacks and he got hit on the back of a head and then he went into this kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't, it's not really an asylum, it's like a hospital for people with kind of brain damage and brain trauma and head trauma and stuff. Except somehow he's developed these psychic powers and uh, yeah Hodges has to stop him and... 
well, there was there were quite a few things I didn't like about this book. For a start, I already knew how it was going to end from the title. You can guess. So even going into Mr. Mercedes, I knew how the trilogy was going to end. Just from the end of watch title. You can probably guess from the, uh, that title how this is going to end as well. I don't know. The problem is, is that Mr. Mercedes was great because it was like a hard-boiled crime book. And then suddenly you've got all this psychic shit going on. And I'm just like, oh, no. Like, I, I like, don't get me wrong. King can do some good stuff with, you know, psychic powers and all this stuff in his writing. But I, I didn't like that he combined it with this hard-boiled detective. I would have liked him to have kept it to that, you know. And really, because as well, that would have helped us to kind of... By, by giving Brady Hartsfeld these superpowers... Is it Hartsfeld? No, Hartsfield. So by giving Brady Hartsfield these superpowers, he basically turns him into a supervillain, as opposed to just a dude who does bad things. And that was why he was so intriguing as an antagonist, was that he was just a normal person. So as soon as he starts having these weird superpowers, it just bugged me. And also... The entire book relies on the fact that this one character went to visit him while he was in hospital. And I don't think that character would have done that. So, but if she didn't, the entire book wouldn't have happened. <laughs> and he made up a lot of stuff about tech and how tech works that just really bugged me because it kept pulling me out of the story because I was like, you can't do that. DDoSed a website and somehow by doing that was able to... Uh, you know, you customize the error message on the website. It's like, no, it would, you'd just get like a server not available error. You couldn't, you can just arbitrarily change the way the internet works, mate. So I gave that a 3.5 out of 5. Again, I mean, wait, that's one of the books. What I would rec recommend, unless you're a really hardcore Stephen King fan, you want to read all of his books, don't bother with that book. Don't bother with Finders Keepers. Maybe read Mr. Mercedes, but then just stop after Mr. Mercedes. Okay, then I had Gristle from Factory Farms to Food Safety, Thinking Twice About the Meat We Eat, edited by Moby with me and Park. And at first I was a little bit worried because I thought the entire thing was going to be written by Moby. But no, he only wrote the introduction. And then it's basically a bunch of different essays by people who know their stuff about animal rights, farming, even the environment, all this kind of stuff. Because this is the problem is that factory farming affects lots of different areas like you might you might be tempted to think that it's just an issue you know of non-meat eaters being like oh i'll have some compassion for the animals which it kind of is don't get me wrong but at the same time a lot of the the problems with factory farming are actually the system itself so i i filmed a review on this which i haven't posted yet but mainly because it got it just got me really angry but for example it goes into some of the different problems with factory farms are being built in places because you know, these big companies are basically buying the local council and the local governments to get them to pass planning permission. There's actually no real legislation stopping some of the shady practices from happening. There's actually ag-gag laws to stop people from speaking out. And this is in America we're talking about. And this is what kind of got me, got me angry, I guess, is that America calls itself this you know, and no offence to my American viewers, but it calls itself this country where everything's about freedom, democracy, freedom of speech, the, you know, the freedom to chase the American dream. And yet these big companies in the, in the meat industry are doing the same things as shady practices as, say, the oil industry and, like, things when there was a big Enron scandal and stuff like that. That's all happening in the meat industry. We have factory farms deliberately employing illegal immigrants so that those immigrants can't then make official complaints or form unions or anything like that. People flat out getting fired for speaking out from within the company. So, for example, there was a guy who said... The, you know, the chicken line is moving too quickly. We can't do this. More people are getting injured because we're doing it too quickly. There are no laws to govern the speed of the line anyway. And they got fired for complaining that people were at risk and were getting injured. And then that's not to say about the fact that a lot of these factory farms fill up these cesspits with fucking chicken shit. And then the cesspits overflow and get into the groundwater. They get into people's drinking water. They're causing asthma. There was one school where a substitute teacher spent the entire day going around with a fly swatter. Because that was the biggest problem to the kids' education. There's just some fucked up shit happening, man. And uh, this book, I don't know, it helped to highlight it. It wasn't the best book on meat production that I've read I don't think but it was probably a pretty good introduction to just the scope of the problems here we've got here the problems health workers taxpayer cost environment animals children's health global hunger communities zoonotic diseases climate change taxpayer cost that's another one if I was American I'd be super pissed off that my tax money was going to pay for farms that are just killing the planet but whatever you do you man 
So yeah, that was a 4 out of 5. This is the point at which the video starts getting disliked, isn't it? Uh, then I have John Lloyd, James Harkin, and Ann Miller. 1,423 QI facts to bowl you over. QI is a TV show here in the UK. It used to be hosted by Stephen Fry. It's now hosted by Sandy Toxfig. And basically, it's like a general knowledge show, which is kind of fact-based as well, but on obscure facts. So I'm going to read you a couple random facts to give you a feel for this. The average Olympic Games goes 156% over budget. The global beauty and anti-aging industry is worth 999 billion a year. Dollars, that is. List had a stalker who stole the dregs of his tea and used it as perfume. More people visit France than any other country on Earth. It is illegal in the UK to be drunk in charge of a horse. So yeah, it's basically just a collection of facts. I, I went through this in a day as well, although you could just flick in and out of it. But personally, it's actually, I found it quite addictive to keep reading. So, And it's also structured pretty well in terms of... It feels like there's almost a narrative, you know, the facts make logical sense in the order that they're in. So I, I, I gave this a 4 out of 5 as well. I know, I gave, gave out a lot of 4s, it's fine. Then we have Nora Ekstena, Soviet Milk, and this is another Latvian literature book. This is published by uh, Perrin Press. And I posted a review of this on my channel, actually, and it's, it's got loads of views, which I'm super happy about, because I want to spread the word. And in the original, this was called Mates Piens, which means mother's milk. And you can kind of see that throughout it. I would definitely call it, it's kind of like literary fiction with historical fiction as well. Um, but, you know, told to a contemporary audience from a contemporary author, which I think is why it's so cool. And um, it basically follows this mother and daughter, and neither of them are really given names. And it's not one of those books where loads of things happen, but it is one of those books that's kind of deeply philosophical and makes you think a lot. And so for that, I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. And it's a very good translation as well. I recommend you check this one out. Okay, then we have Simon Tofield, Simon's Cat and Kitten Chaos. This is the one that my girlfriend got me. It's much of the same old, same old, except now Simon's Cat has kittens. Yeah, I just, I, I actually uh, just went through this while editing uh, YouTube videos. And it was, it was a 3 out of 5. I mean, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to give it anything worse than that because it, I guess it's purely subjective. And I don't actually watch Simon's Cat as well, so... I have subscribed to his channel now, but actually after reading the books, I don't know if I even want to watch any of the videos, but yeah, I mean, I get, I think it's one of those things where if you're a Simon's Cat fan, you really like it. The problem is, is that I don't want to give this a two or something like that because I wouldn't have bought this for myself, not after the first one. Okay, then we have my re-readathon 2018 book. So this is the Catalyst Reads re-readathon and not the other one that's, that's been organized. And, uh... So for March, I reread Bob Dylan Chronicles Volume 1. So I did this via audiobook with my girlfriend listening in as well. And we both really enjoyed it. We did have to switch narrators because we got a version on YouTube that turned out to be like truncated after the first disc. But it was actually, well, I mean, I, w I went back to my original review on Goodreads and I'd given it a 4 out of 5. And this go round, I gave it a 5 out of 5. And I don't know if that's just because the audiobook made it feel more like a conversation as well. But it was just so good and so fascinating just to hear his stories and how he got to where he is. Even to hear about some of the authors that he read himself. So he's into the Russian authors, for example. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. There's a review of this coming soon in which I try and speak in a bad American accent. But it's okay because it's slightly less cringy because the, the video also froze of me doing like this. Okay, then we have Paolo Coelho, The Alchemist. And I filmed a review of this which hasn't been posted yet. <laughs> and I got really ragey in this review, so I guess I didn't enjoy this book as much as I thought I did. I think I actually downgraded my rating. The problem is, is it's like a giant fable that's basically saying, Go for your dreams, go for your dreams. And I'm like, I am going for my dreams, mate. And I don't need your sort of a sanctimonious, faux-religious modern day fable to encourage me to do that. I feel like this book is written for exactly for the kind of people, like there's a guy in this who wants to go to Mecca, but he doesn't actually want to go to Mecca. He just wants to think about going to Mecca. And this book is written for people like that dude who just want to think about going to Mecca, rather than for people who are actually already on their way to Mecca. So, I don't know. I, I... It didn't, it didn't live up to the hype for me. It was also very insta-lovey. The main character was obsessed with this girl he'd only met once. 
and then he went on his journey, totally forgot about this girl, and then got obsessed with another character, literally the moment he set eyes on her. And the narrative is all like, it was love, that supreme love that is beamed down from the deity and rises up through the soles of his feet, through God's petals, the sands of the desert. And you're just like, all right, mate, all right. Yeah, I'm gonna downgrade this even more from my previous review. I, this is a three out of five. It tried to be something it's not. Okay, then we have Dr. Seuss, Catus Petasatus, and this is the cat in the hat in Latin. I'm going to attempt to read you some, even though I don't need Latin at all. Nans in ola piscis tremit, at magna vos gemit, absit cladas repentina, nunc alfert volatina, non sunt intus usurpanda, sunt hinc statim deportanda, nu supelux ever tata, Never domus deliato. Okay, so I'm gonna try and interpret that with my limited knowledge of Latin. The swimming fish has the document. But I repent. I'm just very volatile. Please don't usurp me or try to deport me. Don't always That's like a suplex, like a you know, like a, a wrestling suplex. Don't always suplex me and never delete me from your house. All right, let's see how close I was. It says, oh no, I don't actually have the original translation. It doesn't have the original translation, so I have no idea. Let me go and see. Fortunately, it does use the original illustrations, so I can try and find that page. Right, I've already forgotten what it was that I said, so I guess in post-production we'll see how, how well I did this. But what this is supposed to say is, No, not in the house, said the fish in the pot. They should not fly kites in a house, they should not. Oh, the things they will bump, oh, the things they will hit. Oh, I do not like it, not one little bit. So basically all I got was fish. But yeah. It was actually really fascinating to read it like that, and uh, it took me quite a long time because I was trying to understand it. Yeah, I gave it a 4 out of 5. If you get a chance to pick this up, definitely do so. Then we have Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give, and this was a buddy read with Todd the Librarian and Beth Chat's books, I think. Sorry if I've got it wrong. I actually can't remember who we buddy read this with now. I've been doing too many of the things. And um, I know this has had a lot of hype, so I wasn't too sure. I was actually worried I wasn't going to like it. No, it was very good. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. There were a few bits that I wasn't sold on, but overall, I thought it was very well done. I thought it was very well thought out in terms of what would actually happen as well. One of the things I did think is that we don't really get to meet Khalil as a character before he gets shot, but actually that kind of reflects the way we see it in the news all the time. You know, we don't know these people. They just get shot by the cops, and then afterwards we start to find out who they were and what they were about and stuff. And it's just sad that somebody would have to be murdered by a policeman for us to for that to happen But that's very much what happens in this book, but I do think it's it's very inspiring and uplifting as well I think it if nothing else this gave me the message that you know We all need to make our voices heard We all need to say what we think should happen to make the world a better fairer place And that doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether you're black whether you're male whether you're female whether you're LGBT Whether you're geez, I don't know a child you don't you know it doesn't matter you have to make your voice heard because nobody else is going to do it for you and that's what this book taught me all right then we were getting towards the end of the month so i may have just read a few short ones now actually i should explain here i have a very specific way of reading so i read a series book and then a non-series book except my definition of series for that is basically any author i've read before so for example, Angie Thomas counted as a non-series. I've never read anything of hers before, which is right. Before that, I read The Cat in the Hat because I had already read The Cat in the Hat. And then before that, it was Paolo Coelho because I'd never read any Paolo Coelho. So basically, because of that, I happen to have read some of these little Ladybird books. They're the Ladybird books for grown-ups. So what I did was I used that to sort of trick the system I'm missing a book here, actually. So I used that to sort of trick the system so I could be trying to read more new books, if that makes sense. So I read The Ladybird Book of Red Tape by J.A. Hazley and J.C. Morris, I think. Or did I get that the wrong way around? 
J.A. Hazley and J.P. Morris. And uh, basically it's just, uh, it's a, a ra ladybird book for adults. So, uh, for example, Roddy's bicycle has been stolen. Colour? asks the policeman. Black, says Roddy. Breed? asks the policeman. The policeman suspects he may have picked the wrong form, but he is halfway down now. So it's just amusing. I think I gave it a 3.5 out of 5 because I couldn't justify giving it any higher than that. But that then allowed me to get to a non-series book and to read something by a new author to me. So I picked up 18 by Paul Zbankowskis, translated from Latvian by Jeva Lasinska. And this is basically set around the time of the Latvian Revolution. It kind of follows a soldier who's going around and he's writing a journal on a diary that he keeps in his boot. And the problem that I had was that there wasn't really a plot to it, but there also the characters didn't really come alive to me that much as well. It was more about the author's philosophy. So, for example, there was a lot of airtime given to his theory that time is like a pancake or a stack of pancakes. His encounters with various characters lead him to develop theories on space, time, freedom, and what it means to be human. He wonders what if time is layered like a stack of pancakes, and what if a tree with roots and branches that grow expansively in every direction enjoys an ideal, perfectly balanced sort of freedom. It just read like a stoner just being like, oh man, I've got this theory, what if all cats are aliens, but they communicate through their meows, and dogs can hear their meows, and that's why dogs are so friendly to humans, because they're trying to tell us why the cats are meowing. Like, the entire book felt like that. It reminded me of The Alchemist. It was just like... It felt preachy as though you're expected to just agree with all these random theories that the characters or the authors have or whatever. And for me, that's always a turn-off in a book because I very rarely do agree with them. So for this, I, I think I gave it a 3.5. It was alright. I wouldn't recommend this one over Soviet Milk, though. Okay, then I picked up... The Ladybird Book of the Zombie Apocalypse by J.A. Hazley and J.C. Morris, J.P. Morris, whoever it was before. Uh, and this is just about the same thing as before, but with zombies. It actually wasn't as good, so I think in hindsight I'm going to give this one a 3 out of 5. Yeah, it was fine. But it did at least then allow me to switch around to another new-to-me author, so I picked up Wonder by R.J. Palacio. And this is, I've heard it described as middle grade, and I guess it follows middle grade characters, but I enjoyed it as an adult. It's also been compared to The Curious Incident of the Dog of the Nighttime by Mark Haddon, and I can kind of see that. It basically follows this kid called August, who was born with kind of a facial disfigurement. He's had a lot of operations to try and correct it. During the book, he has to get like a headset for a hearing aid so that he can hear properly. So he's not had the best of lives as poor August. And this book basically follows what happens when he decides to go to school as opposed to being homeschooled. And we see it through the eyes of several different characters. And I actually didn't like that too much, the, the, the hopping between the different characters. I think I would have preferred to have seen the whole thing from August's point of view. But, you know, it worked fine. It didn't work badly. It didn't work against the book. It's just a personal preference for me, I guess. There's also a very sad bit with a dog. If you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. All in all, it was just a very, it was just a very touching book. It, it reminds me of, it's a very booktube book. You can tell, right, people on booktube love books that are kind of specifically engineered to give you the feels. And this one is definitely engineered to give you the feels. But um, yeah, it was all right. I, I gave it a four out of five, and I think I'm going to stick to that. I'm, I'm not impressed in hindsight by, basically, RJ, I looked up to see, oh, has RJ Palacio written anything else? Maybe I'll check out some more of her work. And everything else that she's written is just a wonder spin-off. She's done about eight of the things. And I'm just, I lo I've just lost a bit of respect for her for that. I, I don't know. And finally, I had to actually nip outside to get this last one. Because I finished this last night. And this, and left it outside in the porch, as you do. This is Five Give Up the, Blue Five Give Up the Booze by Enid Blyton. Except it's actually written by Bruno Vincent. Published by Quirkus. It's part of the Enid Blyton for Grown Up series. So it's basically about... It's like a Famous Five adventure by Enid Blyton, except they are grown-ups and they are trying to stop drinking. And what I particularly liked, I think, was it, it does obey all of the elements of good storytelling. So, that, you know, to the point at the end, I really like the ending. So, um, so they, they get there and they're waiting and it's like, oh, it's almost midnight. It's almost February. We can drink again. And we have here, uh, happy February, said George, clinking her glass against his and thinking February was going to be her month for giving up secret eating. 
I love you chaps so much, said Anne, clinking hers too, and deciding that it would be a non-smoking February and a non-smoking life for her. So it just does remind me of what people are like, and what I am like as well, in that you try and be healthy, but you always end up tackling one thing at a time, and there's always something else that you should probably work on as well. Oh, that was epic. This is possibly one of the longest amounts of time I've spent just filming a single video, so hopefully I cut it down a bit in the edit, but equally, it's been a good month. I read as many books as I hauled, which is good, plus I unhauled some, so I actually made a dent in my TBR shelves. If, you're, if you've got this far and you're wondering why I'm wearing a suit, that's just part of the booktube suit movement, I guess. I don't know if it's still a thing, but I think I'm gonna start doing this for every wrap-up now. I'm not gonna necessarily do it for other videos, but but uh, yeah, I'm probably, I'm, I'm, I've noticed I'm heading towards 1500 subscribers. I've had some really lovely shout-outs recently, including from Sean the Book Maniac, so thank you, Sean. Thank you to everybody who spread the love and give me shout-outs and subscribed and all that lovely stuff. When I get to 1500, I will be doing a Q&A, but I also want to do like a reverse Q&A, so I've got some questions I want to ask you guys to get some feedback on the channel as well, and of course there will be the blooper video. So yeah, just thanks for all the support, and I will keep doing what I'm doing if you keep on watching me do it, I guess. So yeah, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. Hit subscribe if you're new here. Leave a comment to let me know if you've read any of these books. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.